This is the first of a series of videos ultimately aiming at an exposition of basic calculus. In this first video we will talk about the concept of numbers and it will have a somewhat philosophical flavor. If you prefer a text version of the video that allows you to take in the mathematical information and results at your own pace, you can find this content in the form of a blog post whose link is provided in the video description. The world in which we live has qualitative, structural and quantitative aspects. If we abstract its quantitative and structural aspects and ignore the qualitative aspect, then we are left with a conceptual realm with its own logical rules to whose study the discipline of mathematics is devoted. In ancient Greece, mathematics was expressed mostly in a language whose basic elements were geometric entities like points and lines whereas in modern mathematics, the basic elements are the natural numbers. Indeed, the natural numbers, 1, 2, 3, etc., seem to be quite fundamental concepts of the reality in which we exist. For example, if we consider three persons, or three apples, or three phones, or three galaxies, or three fairy tales, or three historical events, or three days, or three games, or three geometric figures. Then, while qualitatively very different, what they all share in common is their numerosity. The abstract concept that they share we call the number three. Now, the world appears to consist of things that are either discrete or continuous. Some of the things mentioned are discrete only at the conceptual level. For example, apples, galaxies or iPhones, since they consist of more fundamental constituents, such as molecules, stars, wires, screws and electronic circuits. But for various reasons, such as their function and utility to us, we conceptually regard them as single entities. Other things mentioned, such as games and geometric figures, are not even material things, but concepts entirely. Nevertheless, the world does include things of a discrete nature that exist objectively. For example, physics, and quantum mechanics in particular, tells us that at the most fundamental level, the physical world is discrete, with matter consisting of fundamental particles that cannot be subdivided. But even more fundamentally in my opinion, persons, or selves, such as you and me, are indivisible monads, which is something we can talk about in a future video about the philosophy of mind. The natural numbers arise naturally when we consider the numerosity of discrete things, such as those mentioned in the previous examples. Leopold Kronecker has famously said that natural numbers were created by God, everything else is the work of man. In my opinion, while it can indeed be argued that natural numbers are the most fundamental kind, Kronecker's statement is not entirely true. Natural numbers do not suffice to describe everything because not everything is discrete. So, how about things that we perceive as continuous, at least from a macroscopic point of view, such as length, time, speed, size, mass, force or intensity, for example intensity of light, of sound, etc. Even some of the discrete things that we mentioned previously can be thought of as having fractional parts, for example we can think of half an apple or a quarter of an apple. For continuously varying quantities, does it make more sense to use, like the ancient Greeks, geometry rather than algebra? After all, length can be used as a prototypical continuous quantity that can be used in figures to represent any other continuously varying quantity, whereas the natural numbers seem ill-suited for this. However, the example of splitting an apple into two parts gives us an idea of how to use the natural numbers to express fractional parts. We can split something into an integer number of equal parts and take some of them. This splitting operation can again be abstracted from the type of thing split, resulting in the concept of a rational number, so-called because it expresses a ratio or fraction. For example, taking half of something is conceptualized by the rational number symbolized as one half. And splitting something into three equal parts and taking two of them is conceptualized as the rational number two thirds. In fact, it turns out that the process of taking a whole Splitting it into three parts and taking two of them is equivalent to taking two holes and splitting them into three equal parts. Therefore, the rational number m over n 
can be interpreted as the outcome of splitting a whole into n equal parts and taking m of them, or equivalently as the outcome of taking m wholes and splitting their aggregate into n equal parts. To keep things simple, we will mostly adopt the first interpretation in this video, although both interpretations are equivalent. Note that the numerator m can be greater than the denominator, in which case the number of parts that we have together make more than a whole. For example, 5 half apples makes 2 whole apples plus half an apple. There is a subtle point that should be pointed out. The abstract process of splitting something into n equal parts and taking m of them is not one and the same as the rational number m over n. Rather, the number m over n is an abstraction of the result of that process. It is the quantity relative to a whole that we will get via that process. In fact, we can get the same quantity through different processes. Whether I cut an apple into three parts and take one part, or I cut it into six parts and take two, I end up with the same quantity of apple. These two processes are not entirely the same, yet they produce the same result and hence the numbers one third and two sixths are considered to be the same number. In general, the shown relation holds where c is an arbitrary number and a rational number can be written as infinitely many equivalent fractions. So the concept of rational number is based on the concept of natural number but allows us to quantify things that are not necessarily discrete. Whereas natural numbers only count holes, rational numbers can also count parts of holes. They do so through a mechanism that is based on the concept of natural numbers themselves by defining subholes of the form 1 over n, one among n equal parts of a whole. Because rational numbers are based on the concept of natural numbers, they are inherently based on the concept of a whole on which natural numbers are also based. Three quarters of something means three quarters of a whole, with the latter corresponding to the number one. But what about quantities that vary continuously without an inherent sense of whole, such as distance or time? Three quarters of an apple makes sense, but does three quarters of time make sense? No, but in such cases we can ourselves choose an arbitrary chunk of time and consider it as a whole, as a unit of time, for example, a day or a year. Quantification of continuous magnitudes cannot be made in an absolute sense. Only comparison of one quantity to another makes sense when there is no natural unit. A description of a quantity of some continuous stuff such as time or distance by rational numbers makes sense only in a relative sense as compared to another chosen quantity of the same stuff. To explore the mechanics of numbers it is useful to use some representational contraption. For example, the natural number a can be represented by a box containing a dots. Then the concept of the addition a plus b can be visualized as merging the a and b dots into a single box and the multiplication a times b can be visualized as stacking a rows of b dots into a single box. Such a representation aids us to see in an obvious manner the validity of several truths about the mechanics of the arithmetic of integers. For example, the distributive law can be illustrated as shown. The conclusions we draw from observing these illustrations have general validity provided that they do not depend in any way on the nature of the representational elements we chose. In our example, we chose dots to represent instances of something, but our choice of dots makes no difference to the conclusion. We could have used apples, persons, games, galaxies or whatever else we wanted because the nature of the things used is irrelevant to the substance of the logical arguments made, in line with the abstractive nature of mathematics. Just like dots are convenient for illustrating the mechanics of the arithmetic of discrete things, for continuous quantities it is very convenient to use length as a prototypical continuous quantity for representational purposes. In this case, as mentioned, we must also assume that the unit quantity has also been selected so that the quantification of all other quantities is understood to be in comparison to this selected unit quantity. Then, how numbers measure a continuous quantity can be illustrated by drawing a straight line and marking numbers on it using length as a prototype that represents any continuous quantity. This line is called the number axis and the number that corresponds to each point on the line is an abstraction of the size relation between the length of the segment from 0 to that point compared to that of the unit segment from 0 to 1. 
On this axis we have marked the integer numbers 1, 2, etc. which correspond to 1, 2, etc. of our selected units. The start of the axis is 0, which denotes the case that the continuous quantity is completely lacking. Oftentimes it makes sense to extend the axis in the opposite direction, where numbers are marked with a negative sign. For example, if the continuous quantity is the distance traveled along a line starting from a given point inside the line, then one can transverse it in either direction and the sign can indicate the direction. There are also cases where the placement of zero seems arbitrary, such as in the quantification of temperature, before it was discovered that there is an absolute zero. Where, for example, in the Celsius scale, the zero was arbitrarily placed at a temperature where water freezes and any temperatures colder than that are assigned negative values. There are also cases where two opposite states compete with each other, such as positive and negative charge, or credit and debt in finance, where the sign of the numbers indicates the prevailing state. In these and other cases, the concept of a negative number makes sense and is useful, and we can account for it in our illustrative model by extending our line in the opposite direction, from 0 to infinity, marking on it the negative integers. How about fractional parts? We can mark any rational number we desire on the axis by splitting each unit of the axis into 1, 2, 3, etc. equal parts, as many as we wish, and taking, again, as many as we wish from them. If we split them into 2, we get the numbers 1 half, 2 halves, 3 halves, etc. If we split them into 3, we get the numbers 1 third, 2 thirds, 3 thirds, 4 thirds, etc. and so on. This procedure can be continued to infinity, so that every number of the form m over n, that is every rational number, will eventually be marked on the line. The points become denser and denser as we increase the denominator n, that is the number of parts that this unit is split into. Apart from the concept of a number itself, it makes sense to consider also manipulations of numbers, which are abstractions of actual processes that occur in the real world. Addition and this opposite, subtraction, are perhaps the most basic operations. How to add or subtract rational numbers becomes apparent if we express them in terms of the same division of unity by scaling both the numerator and denominator of each number by the denominator of the other number. This operation becomes straightforward by expressing both numbers as multiples of the same quantity, 1 over b times d, the reciprocal of the product of denominators. The possibility of expressing both numbers as integer multiples of the same subunit, namely 1 over b times d in this case, is called commensurability, and the numbers a over b and c over d are characterized as commensurable. The number 1 over b times d, highlighted in yellow, is their common measure. It is a number that can fit an integer number of times into both numbers. Actually, commensurable numbers have infinitely many common measures. For example, 1 over 2 times b times d and 1 over 3 times b times d are also common measures of the rational numbers a over b and c over d. Since a over b and c over d are arbitrary rational numbers, this means that all rational numbers, which express fractions of the same underlying unit, are commensurable with each other. And of course, for most of all, all rational numbers are commensurable with the unity of which they express a fraction. Subtraction is the opposite of addition. It undoes what addition does and means removal. In the case of quantities that can assume both positive and negative values, subtraction of b from a simply means to start from a, whether positive or negative, and go in the opposite direction of b, again whether positive or negative, by an amount equal to the magnitude of b. Now let us turn to the multiplication of rational numbers. First, let us remind ourselves that the rational number a over b is the result of the process of splitting the unit into b equal parts and taking a of them. The multiplication of another number by a over b is the result of applying the same process on that other number rather than on unity. So, the multiplication of c over d by a over b means splitting c over d into b equal parts and taking a of them. Let us start with the splitting. c over d itself is c subunits of sides 1 over d. To split it into b equal parts, we can split each of the 1 over d size subunits into b parts, 
and sum them. If we split each of these subunits into B parts, we will end up with smaller subunits of size 1 over B times D. We can see this by considering that 1 over D is contained in 1 D times and 1 over D divided by B is contained B times in 1 over D. Therefore, overall, 1 over D divided by B is contained in 1 B times D times. And we have C of these subunits for a total of C over B times D. This was just the application of the splitting part of A over B to C over D. Now we also have to apply the part that calls for taking A parts. This leaves us with a total of A times C subunits of size 1 over B times D each, overall. From the shown formula, it should be apparent that we could have gotten exactly the same result if the roles of the two numbers were reversed. That is, if, if we had applied C over D to A over B instead of the other way around. Remember the commutative property of the natural numbers. A times C equals C times A, and B times D equals D times B. Therefore, the commutative property holds also for rational numbers. From a geometrical perspective, the product of two rational numbers is equal to the area of a rectangle whose sides have lengths equal to the two numbers respectively, just as with the product of two natural numbers. To see this, we can proceed as follows. We will examine the product of the two rational numbers a over b and c over d. First, consider the area of a rectangle of sides a and c. Since a and c are integers, it is easy to see that the area of that rectangle is equal to a times c units. In the figure shown, the unit lengths comprising each side of the rectangle are numbered from 1 to a on the vertical side and from 1 to c on the horizontal side. Each of the drawn subrectangles has unit sides and therefore has an area of 1. There are a times c such subrectangles, hence the total area is a times c units of area. Now divide the a side into b equal parts and the c side into d equal parts and extend these divisions into the rectangle by horizontal and vertical lines to divide the area into b times d equal subrectangles, not of unit area this time. Since, as we previously found, the total area is A times C, the area of each of the subrectangles is A times C divided by B times D, which, as we saw, happens to equal the product of the rational numbers A over B times C over D. Now, zoom in to examine one of these subrectangles. Each sides have length A over B and C over D, respectively, since the original rectangle has sides A and C and we split them into B and D equal parts, respectively. Therefore, we conclude that the area of a rectangle of sides A over B and C over D is equal to A over B times C over D area units, where the area unit is the area of a square of side 1. This is what we set out to show. Finally, division is the reverse operation compared to multiplication. It undoes what multiplication does. Multiplying something by A over B splits it into B equal parts and takes A of them. Dividing by A over B undoes this. To undo it, we have to split the result into A parts to undo the taking A of them and take B of them to undo splitting into B equal parts. But this is just multiplying by B over A. Therefore, we arrive at the following equivalent. The result of the division, let's call it Q for quotient, can also be seen as the answer to the question, how many times does A over B fit into C over D? Indeed, if the quotient Q is the answer to this question, then putting together Q of the numbers A over B, we should obtain C over D. In other words, multiplying A over B by Q should result in C over D. This is indeed the case, as follows from the above equation. When the divisor a over b is an integer, say a over b equals n, then division by it simply means to split the dividend into n equal parts and take one of them. But this is exactly what the symbol that we use for fractions also means. 
Therefore, by generalizing, we use the symbols of division and fraction interchangeably. Let us recap. The natural and rational numbers are abstractions that allow us to quantify discrete and continuous things respectively. It appears then that we have the tools to quantify everything and our work is done. However, although indeed from a practical point of view the natural numbers and their derivative rational numbers suffice, it turns out that reality, the world in which we live, is actually more complicated and has aspects that cannot be quantified precisely by these numbers. We will turn to this topic in the next video.